Section 12 of The Lane That Had No Turning. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Lane That Had No Turning and Other Tales Concerning the People of Pontiac by Gilbert Parker. The Story of the Lime Burner for a man in whose life there had been tragedy he was cheerful he had a habit of humming vague notes in the silence of conversation as if to put you at your ease his body and face were lean and arid his eyes oblique and small his hair straight and dry and straw-coloured and it flew out crackling with electricity to meet his cap as he put it on he lived alone in a little hut near his lime-kiln by the river with no near neighbors and few companions save his four dogs and these he fed sometimes at the expense of his own stomach he had just enough crude poetry in his nature to enjoy his surroundings for he was well placed behind the lime kiln rose knoll on knoll and beyond these the verdant hills all converging to dalgrotha mountain in front of it was the river with its banks dropping forty feet and below the rapids always troubled and sportive on the farther side of the river lay peaceful areas of meadow and cornland and low-roofed hovering farmhouses with one larger than the rest having a windmill and a flagstaff this building was almost large enough for a manor and indeed it was said that it had been built for one just before the conquest in seventeen fifty nine but the war had destroyed the ambitious owner and it had become a farmhouse paradis always knew the time of day by the way the light fell on the windmill he had owned this farm once he and his brother fabian and he loved it as he loved fabian and he loved it now as he loved fabian's memory in spite of all they were cheerful memories both of brother and house at twenty-three they had become orphans with two hundred acres of land some cash horses and cattle and plenty of credit in the parish or in the county for that matter both were of hardy dispositions but fabian had a taste for liquor and henri for pretty faces and shapely ankles yet no one thought the worse of them for that especially at first an old servant kept house for them and cared for them in her honest way both physically and morally she lectured them when at first there was little to lecture about it is no wonder that when there came a vast deal to reprove the bone desisted altogether overwhelmed by the weight of it henri got a shock the day before their father died when he saw fabian lift the brandy used to mix with the milk of the dying man and pouring out a third of a tumbler drink it off smacking his lips as he did so as though it were a cordial that gave him a cue to his future and to fabian's after their father died fabian gave way to the vice he drank in the taverns he was at once the despair and the joy of the parish for wild as he was he had a gay temper a humorous mind a strong arm and was the universal lover the cure who did not of course know one-fourth of his wildness had a warm spot for him in his heart but there was a vicious strain in him somewhere and it came out one day in a perilous fashion there was in the hotel of the louis cons an english servant from the west called nell barraway she had been in the hotel in montreal and it was there fabian had seen her as she waited at table she was a splendid-looking creature all life and energy tall fair-haired and with a charm above her kind she was also an excellent servant could do as much as any two women in any house and was capable of more airy diablerie than any ten of her sex in pontiac when fabian had said to her in montreal that he would come to see her again he told her where he lived she came to see him instead for she wrote to the landlord of the louis Combs, and closed fine testimonials and was at once engaged fabian was stunned when he entered the louis Combs and saw her waiting at table alert busy good to behold she nodded at him with a quick smile as he stood bewildered just inside the door then said in english this way monsieur 
as he sat down he said in english also with a laugh and with snapping eyes good lord what brings you here ladybird as she pushed a chair under him she whispered through his air you and then was gone away to fetch pea soup for six hungry men the louis cons did more business now in three months than it had done before in six but it became known among a few in pontiac that nell was notorious how it had crept up from montreal no one guessed and when it did come her name was very intimately associated with fabian's no one could say that she was not the most perfect of servants and also no one could say that her life in pontiac had not been exemplary yet wise people had made up their minds that she was determined to marry fabian and the wisest declared that she would do so in spite of everything religion she was a protestant character race she was clever as the young seigneur found as the little avocat was forced to admit as the cure allowed with a sigh and she had no airs of badness at all and very little of usual coquetry fabian was enamoured and it was clear that he intended to bring the woman to the manor one way or another henri admitted the fascination of the woman felt it despaired went to montreal got proof of her career came back and made his final and only effort to turn his brother from the girl he had waited an hour outside the hotel for his brother and when fabian got in he drove on without a word after a while fabian who was in high spirits said open your mouth henri come along sleepy-head straightway he began to sing a rollicking song and henri joined in with him heartily for the spirit of fabian's humour was contagious there was a little man the foolish gayeri karabi he went unto the chase of partridges the chase karabi titi karabi toto karabo you are going to break your neck my lovely gayeri he was about to begin another verse when henri stopped him saying you're going to break your neck fabian what's up henri was the reply you're drinking hard and you don't keep good company fabian laughed can't get the company i want so what i can get i have henri my lad don't drink henri laid his free hand on fabian's knee whiskey wine is meat and drink to me i was born on new year's day old coffin face whiskey wine day they ought to call it holy the empty jars that day henri sighed that's the drink fabian he said patiently give up the company i'll be better company for you than that girl fabian girl what the devil do you mean she nell barraway was the company i meant fabian nell barraway you mean her bosh i'm going to marry her henri you mustn't fabian said henri eagerly clutching fabian's sleeve but i must my henri she's the best-looking wittiest girl i ever saw splendid never lonely with her looks and brains isn't everything fabian isn't it though isn't it yeah you try it not without goodness henri's voice weakened that's bosh of course it is henri my dear if you love a woman if she gets hold of you gets into your blood loves you so that the touch of her fingers sets your pulses going pom pom you don't care a sou whether she is good or not you mean whether she was good or not no i don't i mean is good or not for if she loves you she'll travel straight for your sake pshaw you don't know anything about it i know all about it know all about it you're in love you yes fabian sat open-mouthed for a minute go damn he said it was his one english oath is she good company he asked after a minute she's the same as you keep the same viola you mean nell nell asked fabian in a dry choking voice yes nell from the first time i saw her but i'd cut my hand off first i'd think of you of our people that have been here for two hundred years of the rooms in the old house where mother used to be fabian laughed nervously 
holy heaven and you've got her in your blood too yes but i'll never marry her fabian at montreal i found out all about her she was as bad that's nothing to me henri said fabian but something else is here you are now i'll make a bargain his face showed pale in the moonlight if you'll drink with me do as i do go where i go play the devil when i play it and never squeal never hang back i'll give her up but i've got to have you got to have you all the time everywhere hunting drinking or letting alone you'll see me out for you're stronger had less of it i'm for the little low house in the grass bien tot stop the horses henri stopped them and they got out they were just opposite the lime kiln and they had to go a few hundred yards before they came to the bridge to cross the river to their home the light of the fire shone in their faces as fabian handed the flask to henri and said let's drink to it henri you have and me have he was deadly pale henri drank to the finger mark set and then fabian lifted a flask to his lips good-bye nell he said here's to the good times we've had he emptied the flask and threw it over the bank into the burning lime and garat the old lime burner being half asleep did not see or hear the next day the two went on a long hunting expedition and the following month nell barraway left for montreal henri kept to his compact drink for drink sport for sport one year the crops were sold before they were reaped horses and cattle went little by little then came the mortgage and still henri never wavered never weakened in spite of the cure and all others the brothers were always together and never from first to last did henri lose his temper or openly lament that ruin was coming surely on them what money fabian wanted he got the cure's admonitions availed nothing for fabian would go his gait the end came on the very spot where the compact had been made for passing the lime kiln one dark night as the two rode home together fabian's horse shied the bank of the river gave way and with a startled ah henri the profligate and his horse were gone into the river below next month the farm and all were sold henri paradis succeeded the old lime burner at his post drank no more ever and lived his life in sight of the old home. End of section 12。section 13 of the lane that had no turning。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。Recording by Kate Fallis. The Lane That Had No Turning and Other Tales Concerning the People of Pontiac by Gilbert Parker. The Woodsman's Story of the Great White Chief. The old woodsman shifted the knife with which he was mending his fishing rod from one hand to the other and looked at it musingly before he replied to Medallion yes monsieur i knew the white chief as they called him this was his holding up the knife and this taking a watch from his pocket he gave them to me i was with him in the circle on the great journey tell us about him then medallion urged for there are many tales and who knows which is the right one the right one is mine holy he was to me like a father then i know more of the truth than any one he paused a moment looking out on the river where the hot sun was playing with all its might then took off his cap with deliberation laid it beside him and speaking as it were into the distance began he once was a trader of the hudson's bay company of his birth some said one thing some another i know he was buku genteel and his heart it was a lion's once when there was trouble with the chipways he went alone to their camp 
and say he will fight their strongest man to stop the trouble he twists the neck of the great fighting man of the tribe so that it go with a snap and that ends it and he was made a chief for you see in their hearts they all hated their strong man well one winter there come down to fort a god two eskimos and they say that three white men are wintering by the coppermine river they had travelled down from the frozen seas when their ship was locked in the ice but can get no farther they were sick with the evil skin and starving the white chief say to me galloy will you go to rescue them i would have gone with him to the ends of the world and this was near one end the old man laughed to himself tossed his jet black hair from his wrinkled face and after a moment went on there never was such a winter as that the air was so still by times that you can hear the rustle of the stars and the shifting of the northern lights but the cold at night caught you by the heart and clamp it mon do how it clamp we crawl under the snow and lay in our bags of fur and wool and the dogs hug close to us we were sorry for the dogs and one died and then another and there's nothing so dreadful as to hear the dogs howl in the long night it is like ghosts crying in an empty world the circle of the sun gets smaller and smaller till he only tramp along the high edge of the northwest we got to the river at last and found the camp there's one man dead only one but there were bones oh monsieur you not guess what a thing it is to look upon the bones of man and know that medallion put his hand on the old man's arm wait a minute he said then he poured out coffee for both and they drank before the rest was told it's a creepy story said medallion but go on well the white chief look at the dead man as he sit there in the snow with a book and a piece of paper beside him and the pencil in the book the face is bent forward to the knees the white chief pick up the book and pencil and then kneel down and gaze up in the dead man's face all hard like stone and crusted with frost i thought he would never stir again he took so long i think he was puzzled then he turn and say to me so quiet so awful glory and got up well but it was cold then and my head seemed big and running about like a ball of air but i light a spirit lamp and make some coffee and he opened the dead man's book it is what they call a diary and begin to read all at once i hear a cry and i see him drop the book on the ground and go to the dead man and jerk his fist as if to strike him in the face but he did not strike galois stopped and lighted his pipe and was so long silent that medallion had to jog him into speaking he puffed the smoke so that his face was in the cloud and he said through it no he did not strike he get to his feet and spoke god forgive her like that and come and take up the book again and read he eat and drunk and read the book again and i know by his face that something more than cold was clamp his heart shall we bury him in the snow i say no he spoke let him sit there till the judgment this is a wonderful book galloy he went on he was a brave man but the rest the rest then under his breath almost she was so young but a child i not understand that we start away soon leaving the thing there for four days and then i see that the white chief will never get back to fort pentecost but he read the dead man's book much i cannot forget that one day he lay looking at the world nothing but the waves of snow shining blue and white on and on the sun lift an eye of blood in the north winking like a devil as i try to drive death away by calling in his ear he wake all at once 
but his eyes seem asleep he tell me to take the book to a great man in montreal he give me the name then he take out his watch and his stop and this knife and put them into my hands and then he pat my shoulder he motioned to have the bag drawn over his head i do it of course that was the end but what about the book medallion asked that book it was strange i took it to the man in montreal tonnerre what a fine house and good wine had he and told him all he whip out a scarf and blow his nose loud and say very angry so she's lost both now what a scoundrel he was which one did he mean i had not understand ever since End of section 13section 14 of the lane that had no turning this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by brandy morgan the lane that had no turning and other tales concerning the people of pontiac by gilbert parker uncle jim he was no uncle of mine but it pleased me that he let me call him uncle jim it seems only yesterday that for the first time on a farm over the border from the french province i saw him standing by a log outside the woodhouse door splitting maple knots he was all bent by years and hard work with muscles of iron hands gnarled and lumpy but clenching like a vice gray head thrust forward on shoulders which had carried forkfuls of hay and grain and leaned to the cradle and the scythe and been heaped with cordwood till they were like hide and metal white straggling beard and red watery eyes which to me were always hung with an intangible veil of mystery though that maybe was my boyish fancy added to all this he was so very deaf that you had to speak clear and loud into his ear and many people he could not hear at all if their words were not sharp cut no matter how loud a silent withdrawn man he was living close to mother earth twin brother of labor to whom morning and daytime were sounding boards for his axe scythe saw flail and milking pail and night a round hollow of darkness into which he crept shutting the doors called silence behind him till the impish page of toil came tapping again and he stepped awkwardly into the working world once more winter and summer saw him putting the kettle on the fire a few minutes after four o'clock and winter issuing with lantern from the kitchen door to the stable and to the barn to feed the stock in summer sniffling the gray dawn and looking out in his fields of rye and barley before he went to gather the cows for milking and the horses to water for forty years he and his worn-faced wife bowed themselves beneath the oak first to pay for the hundred-acre farm and then to bring up and educate their seven children something noble in them gave them ambitions for their boys and girls which they had never had for themselves but when had gone the forty years in which the little farm had twice been mortgaged to put the eldest son through college as a doctor they faced the bitter fact that the farm had passed from them to rodney the second son who had come at last to keep a hotel in town fifty miles away generous-hearted people would think that these grown-up sons and daughters should have returned the old people's long toil and care by buying up the farm and handing it back to them their rightful refuge in the decline of life but it was not so they were tenants where they had been owners dependents where they had been givers slaves where they were once masters the old mother toiled without a servant the old man without a helper save in harvest time but the great blow came when rodney married the designing milliner who flaunted her wares opposite his bar-room and somehow from the date of that marriage rodney's good fortune and the hotel declined when he and his wife first visited the little farm after their marriage the old mother shrank away from the young woman's painted face and ever afterwards an added sadness showed in her bearing and in her patient smile but she took rodney's wife through the house showing her all there was to show though that was not much 
There was the little parlor with its haircloth chairs, rag carpet, center table, and iron stove with black pipes, all gaily varnished. There was the parlor bedroom off it, with the one feather bed of the house bountifully piled up with coarse homemade blankets, topped by a silk patchwork quilt, the artistic labor of the old wife's evening hours while Uncle Jim peeled apples and strung them to dry from the rafters. There was a room, dining room in summer and kitchen dining room in winter, as clean as aged hands could scrub and dust it, hung about with stray pictures from illustrated papers and a good old clock in the corner, ticking life and youth and hope away. There was the buttery off that with its meager china and crockery, its window looking out on the field of rye, the little orchard of winter apples, and the hedge of cranberry bushes. Upstairs were rooms with no ceilings, where lying on a corn husk bed, you reached up and touched the sloping roof, with windows at the end only, facing the buckwheat field and looking down two miles toward the main road. For the farm was on a concession, or side road, dusty in summer and in winter sometimes impassable for weeks together. It was not much of a home, as any one with the mind's eye can see. But four stalwart men and three fine women had been born, raised, and quartered there, until with good clothes and speaking decent English and tolerable French, and with money in their pockets, hardly got by the old people, one by one they issued forth into the world. The old mother showed Rodney's wife what there was for eyes to see, not forgetting the three hives of bees on the south side, beneath the parlor window. She showed it with a kind of pride, for it all seemed good to her, and every dish and every chair and every corner in the little house had to her a glory of its own, because of those who had come and gone, the firstlings of her flock, the roses of her little garden of love, blooming now in a rougher air than ranged over the little house on the hill. She had looked out upon the pine woods to the east and the meadow land to the north, the sweet valley between the rye field and the orchard, and the good honest air that had blown there for forty years, bracing her heart and body for the battle of love and life. And she had said through all, Behold, it is very good. But the pert milliner saw nothing of all of this. She did not stand abashed in the sacred precincts of a home where seven times the angel of death had hovered over a birthbed. She looked into the face which time's finger had anointed, and motherhood had etched with trouble, and said, "'Tisn't much, is it? Only a clapboard house, and no ceilings upstairs, and rag carpets. Pshaw!" And when she came to wash her hands for dinner, she threw aside the unscented, common bar soap, and shrugging her narrow shoulders at the coarse towel, wiped her fingers on her cambric handkerchief. Any other kind of woman, when she saw the old mother going about with her twisted wrist, a doctor's bad work with a fracture, would have tucked up her dress and tied on an apron to help. But no, she sat and preened herself with tissue-paper sort of pride, of a vain milliner or nervously shifted about, lifting up this and that, curiously supercilious, her tongue rattling on to her husband and to his mother in a shallow, foolish way. She couldn't say, however, that anything was out of order or ill-kept about the place. The old woman's rheumatic fingers made corners clean, and wood as white as snow. The stove was polished, the tins were bright, and her own dress, no matter what her work, neat as a girl's although the old graceful poise of the body had twisted out of drawing. But the real crisis came when Rodney, having stood at the wood-house door and blown the dinner horn as he used to when a boy, the sound floating and crying away across the rye field, the old man came, for, strange to say, that was the one sound he could hear easily, though, as he said to himself, it seemed as small as a pin coming from ever so far away. He came heavily up from the barnyard, mopping his red face and forehead, and now and again raising his hand to shade his eyes, concerned to see the unknown visitors whose horse and buggy were in the stable-yard. He and Rodney greeted outside warmly enough, but there was some trepidation, too, in Uncle Jim's face. He felt trouble brewing, and there is no trouble like that which comes between parent and child. 
silent as he was however he had a large and cheerful heart and nodding his head he laughed the deep quaint laugh which rodney himself of all of his sons had and he was fonder of rodney than any he washed his hands in the little basin outside the wood-house door combed out his white beard rubbed his red watery eyes tied a clean handkerchief around his neck put on a rusty but clean old coat and a minute afterwards was shaking hands for the first time with rodney's wife he had lived much apart from his kind but he had a mind that fastened upon a thought and worked it down until it was an axiom he felt how shallow was this thin flaunting woman of flounces and cheap rouge he saw her sniff at the brown sugar she had always had white at the hotel and he noted that she let rodney's mother clear away and wash the dinner things herself he felt the little crack of doom before it came it came about three o'clock he did not return to the rye field after dinner but stayed and waited to hear what rodney had to say rodney did not tell his little story well for he foresaw trouble in the old home but he had to face this and all coming dilemmas as best he might with a kind of shamefacedness yet with an attempt to carry the thing off lightly he told uncle jim while inside his wife told the old mother that the business of the hotel had gone to pot he did not say who was the cause of that and they were selling out to his partner and coming to live on the farm i'm tired anyway of the hotel job said rodney farming's a better life don't you think so dad it's better for me rod answered uncle jim it's better for me rodney was a little uneasy but won't it be better for me he asked maybe was the slow answer maybe maybe so and then there's mother she's getting too old for the work ain't she she's done it straight along answered the old man straight along till now but milly can help her and we'll have a hired girl eh i don't know i don't know was the brooding answer the place ain't gonna stand it we'll get more out of it answered rodney i'll stock it up i'll put more under barley all the thing wants is working dad put more in get more out now ain't that right the other was looking off toward the rye field where for forty years up and down the hillside he had travelled with the cradle and scythe putting all there was in him into it blinking along the avenue of the past maybe maybe rodney fretted under the old man's vague replies and he said but darn it all can't you tell us what you think his father did not take his eyes off the rye field i'm thinking he answered in the same old-fashioned way that i've been working here since you were born rod i blundered along somehow just boggling my way through i ain't got nothing more to say the farm ain't mine any more but i'll keep my scythe sharp and my axe ground just as i always did and i'm for working as i've always worked as long as i'm let to stay good lord dad don't talk that way things ain't going to be any different for you and mother than they are now only of course he paused the old man pieced out the sentence only of course there can't be two women ruling one house rod you know it as well as i do exactly how rodney's wife told the old mother of the great change rodney never knew but when he went back to the house the gray look in his mother's face told him more than her words ever told before they left that night the pink milliner had already planned the changes which were to celebrate her coming and her ruling so rodney and his wife came all the old man prophesied in a few brief sentences to his wife proving true there was no great struggle on the mother's part she stepped aside from governing and became as like a servant as could be an insolent servant girl came and she and rodney's wife started a little drama of incompetency which should end as the hotel keeping ended wastefulness cheap luxury tawdry living took the place of the old frugal simple life but the mother went about with that unchanging sweetness of face and a body withering about a fretted soul she had no bitterness only a miserable distress but every slight that was put upon her every change every new-fangled idea from the white sugar to the scented soap and the yellow buggy rankled in the old man's heart he had resentment both for the old wife and himself 
and he hated the pink milliner for the humiliation that she heaped upon them both. Rodney did not see one-fifth of it, and what he did see lost its force, because, strangely enough, he loved the gaudy wife who wore gloves on her bloodless hands as she did the housework and spent numberless afternoons in trimming her own bonnets. Her peevishness grew apace as the newness of the experience wore off. Uncle Jim seldom spoke to her, as he seldom spoke to anybody, but she had an inkling of the rancor in his heart, and many a time she put blame upon his shoulders to her husband, when some unavoidable friction came. A year, two years, passed, which were as ten upon the shoulders of the old people, and then in the dead of winter an important thing happened. About the month of March Rodney's first child was expected. At the end of January Rodney had to go away, expecting to return in less than a month. But in the middle of February the woman's sacred trouble came before its time, and on that day there fell such a storm as had not been seen for many a year. The concession road was blocked before day had well set in. No horse could go ten yards in it. The nearest doctor was miles away at Pontiac and for any man to face the journey was to connive with death. The old mother came to Uncle Jim, and as she looked out of a little unfrosted spot on the window at the blinding storm, told him that the pink milliner would die. There seemed to be no other end to it, for the chances were a hundred to one against the strongest man making a journey for the doctor, and another hundred to one against the doctor's coming. No one knows whether Uncle Jim could hear the cries from the torture chamber, but, after standing for a time, mumbling to himself, he wrapped himself in a heavy coat, tied a muffler about his face, and went out. If they missed him, they must have thought him gone to the barn, or in the drive-shed sharpening his axe. But the day went on, and the old mother forgot all the wrongs that she had suffered, and yearned over the trivial woman who was hurrying out into the great space. Her hours seemed numbered at noon, her moments measured as it came toward sundown. But with the passing of the sun the storm sopped, and a beautiful white peace fell on the world of snow. And suddenly out of that peace came six men, and the first that opened the door was the doctor. After him came Uncle Jim, supported between two others. Uncle Jim had made the terrible journey, falling at last in the streets of the county town with frozen hands and feet and not a dozen rods from the doctor's door. They brought him to— he told his story, and with the abating of the storm, the doctor and the villagers drove down to the concessions road, and then made their way slowly up across the fields, carrying the old man with them, for he would not be left behind. An hour after the doctor entered the parlor bedroom, the old mother came out to where the old man sat, bundled up beside the fire with bandaged hands and feet. "'She's safe, Jim, and the child, too,' she said softly. The old man twisted in his chair and blinked into the fire. "'Dang my soul,' he said. The old woman stooped and kissed his gray, tangled hair. She did not speak, and she did not ask him what he meant. But there and then they took up their lives again and lived them out. End of section 14「no one ever visited the house except the little chemist, the avocat, and Medallion, and Medallion, though merely an auctioneer, was the only person on terms of intimacy with its owner, the old seigneur, who for many years had never stirred beyond the limits of his little garden. At rare intervals he might be seen sitting in the large stone porch which gave overweighted dignity to the house itself not very large. An air of mystery surrounded the place. 
in summer the grass was rank the trees seemed huddled together in gloom about the houses the vines appeared to ooze on the walls and at one end where the window shutters were always closed and barred a great willow drooped and shivered in winter the stone walls showed naked and grim among the gaunt trees and furtive shrubs none who ever saw the seigneur could forget him a tall figure with stooping shoulders a pale deeply lined clean-shaven face and a forehead painfully white with blue veins showing the eyes handsome penetrative brooding and made indescribably sorrowful by the dark skin around them there were those in pontiac such as the cure who remembered when the seigneur was constantly to be seen in the village and then another person was with him always a tall handsome youth his son they were fond and proud of each other and were religious and good citizens in a high-bred punctilious way at that time the seigneur was all health and stalwart strength but one day a rumour went abroad that he had quarrelled with his son because of the wife of ferret the miller no one outside knew if the thing was true but julie the miller's wife seemed rather to plume herself that she had made a stir in her little world yet the curious habitants came to know that the young man had gone and after a few years his having once lived there had become a mere memory but whenever the little chemist set foot inside the tall porch he remembered the avocat was kept in mind by papers which he was called upon to read and alter from time to time the cure never forgot because when the young man went he lost not one of his flock but two and medallion knowing something of the story had wormed a deal of truth out of the miller's wife medallion knew that the closed barred rooms were the young man's and he knew also that the old man was waiting waiting in a hope which he never even named to himself one day the silent old housekeeper came rapping at medallion's door and simply said to him come the seigneur medallion went and for hours sat beside the seigneur's chair while the little chemist watched and sighed softly in a corner now and again rising to feel the sick man's pulse or to prepare a cordial the housekeeper hovered behind the high-backed chair and when the seigneur dropped his handkerchief now as always of the exquisite fashion of a past century she put it gently in his hand once when the little chemist touched his wrist his dark eyes rested on him with inquiry and he said soon it was useless trying to shirk the persistency of that look eight hours perhaps sir the little chemist answered with painful shyness the seigneur seemed to draw himself up a little and his hand grasped his handkerchief tightly for an instant then he said soon thank you after a while his eyes turned to medallion and he seemed about to speak but still kept silent his chin dropped on his breast and for a time he was motionless and shrunken but still there was a strange little curl of pride or disdain on his lips at last he drew up his head his shoulders came erect heavily to the carved back of the chair where strange to say the stations of the cross were figured and he said in a cold ironical voice the angel of patience has lied the evening wore on and there was no sound save the ticking of the clock the beat of rain upon the windows and the deep breathing of the seigneur presently he started his eyes opened wide and his whole body seemed to listen i heard a voice he said no one spoke my master 
said the housekeeper. It was a voice without, he said. Monsieur, said the little chemist, it was the wind in the eaves. His face was almost painfully eager and sensitively alert. Hush, he said. I heard a voice in the tall porch. Sir, said Medallion, laying a hand respectfully on his arm, it is nothing. With a light on his face and a proud, trembling energy, he got to his feet. It is the voice of my son, he said. Go, go and bring him in. No one moved, but he was not to be disobeyed. His ears had been growing keener as he neared the subtle atmosphere of that brink where man strips himself to the soul for a lonely voyaging, and he waved the woman to the door. Wait, he said, as her hand fluttered at the handle. Take him to another room. Prepare a supper, such as we used to have. When it is ready, I will come. But listen, and obey. Tell him not that I have but four hours of life. Go, good woman, and bring him in. It was as he said. They found the son, weak and fainting, fallen within the porch a worn bearded man returned from failure and suffering and the husks of evil they clothed him and cared for him and strengthened him with wine while the woman wept over him and at last set him at the loaded well-lighted table then the seigneur came in leaning his arm very lightly on that of medallion with a kind of kingly air and greeting his son before them all as if they had parted yesterday sat down for an hour they sat there and the seigneur talked gaily with a colour to his face and his great eyes glowing at last he rose lifted his glass and said the angel of patience is wise i drink to my son he was about to say something more, but a sudden whiteness passed over his face. He drank off the wine, and as he put the glass down, shivered, and fell back in his chair. Two hours short, chemist, he said, and smiled, and was still. End of section 15《Section Sixteen of the Lane That Had No Turning. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Lane That Had No Turning and Other Tales Concerning the People of Pontiac by Gilbert Parker. Parpon the Dwarf. Part one. Parpon perched in a room at the top of the mill. He could see every house in the village, and he knew people a long distance off. He was a droll dwarf, and in his way had good times in the world. He turned the misery of the world into a game, and grinned at it from his high little airy with the dormer window. He had lived with Ferret, the miller, for some years, serving him with a kind of humble insolence. It was not a joyful day for Ferret when he married Julie. She led him a pretty travel. He had started as her master. He ended by being her slave and victim. She was a willful wife she had made the seigneur de la riviere of the house with the tall porch to quarrel with his son armand so that armand disappeared from pontiac for years when that happened she had already stopped confessing to the good cure so it may be guessed there were things she did not care to tell and for which she had no repentance but parpon knew and medallion the auctioneer guessed and the little chemist's wife hoped that it was not so 
when julie looked at parpon as he perched on a chest of drawers with his head cocked and his eyes blinking she knew that he read the truth but she did not know all that was in his head so she said sharp things to him as she did to everybody for she had a very poor opinion of the world and thought all as flippant as herself she took nothing seriously she was too vain except that she was sorry armand was gone she rather plumed herself on having separated the seigneur and his son it was something to have been the pivot in a tragedy there came others to the village as for instance a series of clerks to the avocat but she would not decline from armand upon them she merely made them miserable but she did not grow prettier as time went on even annette the sad wife of the drunken benoit kept her fine looks but then annette's life was a thing for a book and she had a beautiful child you cannot keep this from the face of a woman nor can you keep the other when the heart rust the rust shows after a good many years armand de la riviere came back in time to see his father die then julie picked out her smartest ribbons capered at the mirror and dusted her face with oatmeal because she thought that he would ask her to meet him at the boy noir as he had done long ago the days passed and he did not come when she saw armand at the funeral a tall man with a dark beard and a grave face not like the armand she had known he seemed a great distance from her though she could almost have touched him once as he turned from the grave she would have liked to throw herself into his arms and cry before them all mon armand and go away with him to the house with the tall porch she did not care about ferrette the mumbling old man who hungered for money having ceased to hunger for anything else even for julie who laughed and shut her door in his face and cowed him after the funeral julie had a strange feeling she had not much brains but she had some shrewdness and she felt her romance askew she stood before the mirror rubbing her face with oatmeal and frowning hard presently a voice behind her said madame julie shall i bring another bag of meal she turned quickly and saw parpon on a table in the corner his legs drawn up to his chin his black eyes twinkling idiot she cried and threw the meal at him he had a very long quick arm he caught the basin as it came but the meal covered him he blew it from his beard laughing softly and twirled the basin on a finger point like that there will need two bags he said imbecile she cried standing angry in the centre of the room ho ho what a big word see what it is to have the tongue of fashion she looked helplessly round the room i will kill you let us die together answered parpon we are both sad she snatched the poker from the fire and ran at him he caught her wrists with his great hands big enough for tall medallion and held her i said together he chuckled not one before the other we might jump into the flume at the mill or go over the dam at the bois noir or there is ferret's musket which he is cleaning gracious but it will kick when it fires it is so old she sank to the floor why does he clean the musket she asked fair and something wicked too in her eye her fingers ran forgetfully through the hair on her forehead pushing it back and the marks of smallpox showed the contrast with her smooth cheeks gave her a weird look parpon got quickly on the table again and sat like a turk with a furtive eye on her who can tell he said at last 
that musket has not been fired for years it would not kill a bird the shot would scatter but it might kill a man a man is bigger kill a man she showed her white teeth with a savage little smile of course it is all guess i asked ferret what he would shoot and he said nothing good to eat i said i would eat what he killed then he got pretty mad and said i couldn't eat my own head holy that was funny for ferret then i told him there was no good going to the boy noir for there would be nothing to shoot well did i speak true madame julie she was conscious of something new in parpon she could not define it presently she got to her feet and said i don't believe you you're a monkey a monkey can climb a tree quick a man has to take the shot as it comes he stretched up his powerful arms with a swift motion as of climbing laughed and added madame julie ferret has poor eyes he could not see a hole in a ladder but he has a kink in his head about the boy noir people have talked pshaw julie said crumpling her apron and throwing it out he is a child and a coward he should not play with a gun it might go off and hit him parpon hopped down and trotted to the door then he turned and said with a sly gurgle ferret keeps at that gun what is good there will be nobody at the boy noir any more i will go and tell him she rushed at him with fury but seeing annette benoit in the road she stood still and beat her foot angrily on the doorstep she was ripe for a quarrel and she would say something hateful to annette for she never forgot that ferret had asked annette to be his wife before herself was considered she smoothed out her wrinkled apron and waited good day annette she said loftily good day julie was the quiet reply will you come in i'm going to the mill for flaxseed benoit has rheumatism poor benoit said julie with a meaning toss of her head poor benoit responded annette gently her voice was always sweet one would never have known that benoit was a drunken idler come in i will give you the meal from my own then it will cost you nothing said julie with an air thank you julie but i would rather pay i do not sell my meal answered julie what's a few pounds of meal to the wife of ferret i will get it for you come in annette she turned towards the door then stopped all at once there was the oatmeal which she had thrown at parpon the basin and the poker she wished she had not asked annette in but in some things she had a quick wit and she hurried to say it was that yellow cat of parpon's it spilt the meal and i went at it with the poker perhaps annette believed her she did not think about it one way or the other her mind was with the sick benoit she nodded and said nothing hoping that the flaxseed would be got at once but when she saw that julie expected an answer she said cecilia my little girl has a black cat so handsome it came from the house of the poor seigneur de la riviere a year ago we took it back but it would not stay annette spoke simply and frankly but her words cut like a knife julie responded with a click of malice look out that the black cat doesn't kill the dear cecilia annette started but she did not believe that cats sucked the life from children's lungs and she replied calmly i am not afraid the good god keeps my child she then got up and came to julie and said it is a pity julie that you have not a child a child makes all right julie was wild to say a fierce thing for it seemed that annette was setting off benoit against ferret but the next moment she grew hot 
her eyes smarted and there was a hint of trouble at her throat she had lived very fast in the last few hours and it was telling on her she could not rule herself she could not play a part so well as she wished she had not before felt the thing that gave a new pulse to her body and a joyful pain at her breasts her eyes got thickly blurred so that she could not see annette and without a word she hurried to get the meal she was silent when she came back she put the meal into annette's hands she felt that she would like to talk of armand she knew now there was no evil thought in annette she did not like her more for that but she felt she must talk and annette was safe so she took her arm sit down annette she said you come so seldom but there is benoit and the child the child has the black cat from the house there was again a sly ring to julie's voice and she almost pressed annette into a chair well it must be only a minute were you at the funeral to-day julie began no i was nursing benoit but the poor seigneur they say he died without confession no one was there except monsieur medallion the little chemist old sylvie and monsieur armand but of course you have heard everything is that all you know queried julie not much more i go out little and no one comes to me except the little chemist's wife she is a good woman what did she say only something of the night the seigneur died he was sitting in his chair not afraid but very sad we can guess by and by he raised his head quickly i hear a voice in the tall porch he said they thought he was dreaming but he said other things and cried again that he heard his son's voice in the porch they went and found monsieur armand then a great supper was got ready and he sat very grand at the head of the table but died quickly when making a grand speech it was strange he was so happy for he did not confess he hadn't absolution this was more than julie had heard she showed excitement the seigneur and monsieur armand were good friends when he died she asked quite all at once annette remembered the old talk about armand and julie she was confused she wished she could get up and run away but haste would look strange you were at the funeral she added after a minute everybody was there i suppose monsieur armand looks very fine and strange after his long travel said annette shyly rising to go he was always the grandest gentleman in the province answered julie in her old vain manner you should have seen the women look at him to-day but they are nothing to him he is not easy to please good day said annette shocked and sad moving from the door suddenly she turned and laid a hand on julie's arm come and see my sweet cecilia she said she is gay she will amuse you she was thinking again what a pity it was that julie had no child to see cecilia and the black cat very well some day you could not have told what she meant but as annette turned away again she glanced at the mill and there high up in the dormer window sat parpon his yellow cat on his shoulder grinning down at her she wheeled and went into the house part two parpon sat in the dormer window for a long time the cat purring against his head and not seeming the least afraid of falling though its master was well out on the window ledge he kept mumbling to himself ho ho ferret is below there with the gun rubbing and rubbing at the rust holy mother how it will kick but he will only meddle if she set her eye at him and come up bold and said ferret 
go and have your whisky wine and then to bed he would sneak away but he has heard something some fool perhaps that benoit no he is sick perhaps the herb woman has been talking and he thinks he will make a fuss but it will be nothing and monsieur armand will he look at her he chuckled at the cat which set its head back and hissed in reply then he sang something to himself parpon was a poor little dwarf with a big head but he had one thing which made up for all though no one knew it or at least he thought so the cure himself did not know he had a beautiful voice even in speaking it was pleasant to hear though he roughened it in a way it pleased him that he had something of which the finest man or woman would be glad he had said to himself many times that even armand de la riviere would envy him sometimes parpon went away off into the bois and perched there in a tree sang away a man shaped something like an animal with a voice like a muffled silver bell some of his songs he had made himself wild things broken thoughts not altogether human the language of a world between man and the spirits but it was all pleasant to hear even when at times there ran a weird dark thread through the woof no one in the valley had ever heard the thing he sang softly as he sat looking down at julie the little white smoke blows there blows here the little blue wolf comes down say la and the hill dwarf laughs in the young wife's ear when the devil comes back to town say la it was crooned quietly but it was distinct and melodious and the cat purred an accompaniment its head thrust into his thick black hair from where parpon sat he could see the house with the tall porch and as he sang his eyes ran from the miller's doorway to it off in the grounds of the dead seigneur's manor he could see a man push the pebbles with his foot or twist the branch of a shrub thoughtfully as he walked at last another man entered the garden the two greeted warmly and passed up and down together part three my good friend said the cure it is too late to mourn for those lost years nothing can give them back as parpon the dwarf said you remember him a wise little man that parpon as he said one day for everything you lose you get something if only how to laugh at yourself armand nodded thoughtfully and answered you are right you and parpon but i cannot forgive myself he was so fine a man tall with a grand look and a tongue like a book ah yes i can laugh at myself for a fool he thrust his hands into his pockets and tapped the ground nervously with his foot shrugging his shoulders a little the priest took off his hat and made the sacred gesture his lips moving armand caught off his hat also and said you pray for him for the peace of a good man's soul he did not confess he had no rights of the church he had refused you many years my son he had a confessor armand raised his eyebrows they told me of no one it was the angel of patience they walked on again for a time without a word at last the cure said you will remain here i cannot tell this here is a small world and the little life may fret me nor do i know what i have of this he waved his hands towards the house or of my father's property i may need to be a wanderer again god forbid have you not seen the will i have got no farther than his grave was the sombre reply the priest sighed they paced the walk again in silence at last the cure said you will make the place cheerful as it once was 
you are persistent replied the young man smiling whoever lives here should make it less gloomy we shall soon know who is to live here see there is monsieur garon and monsieur medallion also the avocat to tell secrets the auctioneer to sell them eh armand went forward to the gate like most people he found medallion interesting and the avocat and he were old friends you did not send for me monsieur said the avocat timidly but i thought it well to come that you might know how things are and monsieur medallion came because he is a witness to the will and in a case here the little man coughed nervously joint executor with monsieur le cure they entered the house in a business-like way armand motioned them to chairs opened the curtains and rang the bell the old housekeeper appeared a sorrowful joy in her face and armand said give us a bottle of the white top sylvie if there is any left there is plenty monsieur she said none has been drunk these twelve years the avocat coughed and said hesitatingly to armand i asked papa and the dwarf to come monsieur there is a reason armand raised his eyebrows in surprise very good he said when will he be here he is waiting at the louis quince hotel i will send for him said armand and gave the message to sylvie who was entering the room after they had drunk the wine placed before them there was silence for a moment for all were wondering why parpon should be remembered in the seigneur's will well said medallion at last a strange little dog is parpon i could surprise you about him and there isn't any reason why i should keep the thing to myself one day i was up among the rocks looking for a strayed horse i got tired and lay down in the shade of the rock of red pigeons you know it i fell asleep something waked me i got up and heard the finest singing you can guess not like any i ever heard a wild beautiful shivery sort of thing i listened for a long time at last it stopped then something slid down the rock i peeped out and saw parpon toddling away the cure stared incredulously the avocat took off his glasses and tapped his lips musingly armand whistled softly so said armand at last we have the jewel in the toad's head the clever imp hid it all these years even from you monsieur le cure even from me said the cure smiling then gravely it is strange the angel in the stunted body are you sure it's an angel said armand whoever knew parpon do any harm queried the cure he's always been kind to the poor put in the avocat with the miller's flower laughed medallion a pardonable sin he gave a quizzical look at the cure do you remember the words of parpon's song asked armand only a few lines and those not easy to understand unless one had an inkling had you the inkling perhaps monsieur replied medallion seriously they eyed each other we will have parpon in after the will is read said armand suddenly looking at the avocat the avocat drew the deed from his pocket he looked up hesitatingly and then said to armand you insist on it being read now armand nodded coolly after a quick glance at medallion then the avocat began and read to that point where the seigneur bequeathed all his property to his son should he return on a condition when the avocat came to the condition armand stopped him i do not know in the least what it may be he said but there is only one by which i could feel bound i will tell you my father and i quarrelled here he paused for a moment clenching his hands before him on the table about a woman and years of misery came i was to blame in not obeying him 
i ought not to have given any cause for gossip whatever the condition as to that matter may be i will fulfil it my father is more to me than any woman in the world his love of me was greater than that of any woman i know the world and women there was a silence he waved his hand to the avocat to go on and as he did so the cure caught his arm with a quick affectionate gesture then monsieur garon read the conditions that Ferret, the miller, should have a deed of the land on which his mill was built, with the dam of the mill, provided that Armand should never so much as by a word again address Julie, the miller's wife. If he agreed to the condition with solemn oath before the curé, his blessing would rest upon his dear son, whom he still hoped to see before he died." when the reading ceased there was silence for a moment then armand stood up and took the will from the avocat but instantly without looking at it handed it back the reading is not finished he said and if i do not accept the condition what then again monsieur garon read his voice trembling a little the words of the will ran but if this condition be not satisfied i bequeath to my son armand the house known as the house with the tall porch and the land according to the deed thereof and the residue of my property with the exception of two thousand dollars which i leave to the cure of the parish the good monsieur fabre i bequeath to parpon the dwarf then followed a clause providing that in any case parpon should have in fee simple the land known as the boy noir and the hut thereon armand sprang to his feet in surprise blurting out something then sat down quietly took the will and read it through carefully when he had finished he looked inquiringly first at monsieur garon then at the cure why parpon he said searchingly the curé, amazed, spread out his hands in a helpless way. At that moment Sylvie announced Parpon. Armand asked that he should be sent in. "'We'll talk of the will afterwards,' he added. Parpon trotted in, the door closed, and he stood blinking at them. Armand put a stool on the table. "'Sit here, Parpon,' he said. Medallion caught the dwarf under the arms and lifted him on the table." Parpon looked at Armand furtively. "'The wild hawk comes back to its nest,' he said. "'Well, well, what is it you want with the poor Parpon?' He sat down and dropped his chin in his hands, looking round keenly. Armand nodded to Medallion, and Medallion to the priest, but the priest nodded back again. Then Medallion said— you and i know the rock of red pigeons parpon it is a good place to perch one's voice is all to oneself there as you know well sing us the song of the little brown diver parpon's hands twitched in his beard he looked fixedly at medallion presently he turned towards the cure and shrank so that he looked smaller still it's all right little son said the cure kindly turning sharply on medallion when was it you heard he said medallion told him he nodded then sat very still they said nothing but watched him they saw his eyes grow distant and absorbed and his face took on a shining look so that its ugliness was almost beautiful all at once he slid from the stool and crouched on his knees then he sent out a low long note like the toll of the bell-bird from that time no one stirred as he sang but sat and watched him they did not even hear sylvie steal in gently and stand in the curtains at the door the song was weird with a strange thrilling charm it had the slow dignity of a chant the roll of an epic the delight of wild beauty 
it told of the little good folk of the scarlet hills in vague allusive phrases their noiseless wanderings their sojourning with the eagle the wolf and the deer their triumph over the winds the whirlpools and the spirits of evil fame it filled the room with the cry of the west wind it called out of the frozen seas ghosts of forgotten worlds it coaxed the soft breezes out of the south it made them all to be at the whistle of the scarlet hunter who ruled the north then passing through veil after veil of mystery it told of a grand seigneur whose boat was overturned in a whirlpool and was saved by a little brown diver and the end of it all and the heart of it all was in the last few lines clear of allegory and the wheel goes round in the village mill and the little brown diver he tells the grain and the grand seigneur he has gone to meet the little good folk of the scarlet hills at first all were so impressed by the strange power of parpon's voice that they were hardly conscious of the story he was telling but when he sang of the seigneur they began to read his parable their hearts throbbed painfully as the last notes died away armand got up and standing by the table said parpon you saved my father's life once parpon did not answer will you not tell him my son said the cure rising still parpon was silent the son of your grand seigneur asks you a question parpon said medallion soothingly oh my grand seigneur said parpon throwing up his hands once he said to me come my brown diver and live with me but i said no i am not fit i will never go to you at the house with the tall porch and i made him promise that he would never tell of it and so i have lived sometimes with old ferret then he laughed strangely again and sent a furtive look at armand parpon said armand gently our grand seigneur has left you the boy noir for your own so the hills and the rock of red pigeons are for you and the little good people if you like parpon with fiery eyes gathered himself up with a quick movement then broke out oh my grand seigneur my grand seigneur and fell forward his head and his arms laughing and sobbing together armand touched his shoulder parpon but parpon shrank away armand turned to the rest i do not understand it gentlemen parpon does not like the young seigneur as he liked the old medallion sitting in the shadows smiled he understood armand continued as for this testament gentlemen i will fulfil its conditions though i swear were i otherwise minded regarding the woman here parpon raised his head swiftly i would not hang my hat for an hour in the tall porch they rose and shook hands then the wine was poured out and they drank it off in silence parpon however sat with his head in his hands come little comrade drink said medallion offering him a glass parpon made no reply but caught up the will kissed it put it into armand's hand and then jumping down from the table ran to the door and disappeared through it part four the next afternoon the avocat visited old ferret ferret was polishing a gun mumbling the while sitting on some bags of meal was parpon with a fierce twinkle in his eye monsieur garon told ferret briefly what the seigneur had left him with a quick greedy chuckle ferret threw the gun away man alive said he tell me all about it all the good news there's nothing to tell he left it that is all oh the good seigneur cried ferret the grand seigneur someone laughed scornfully in the doorway it was julie 
look there she cried he gets the land and throws away the gun brag and coward miller it is for me to say the grand seigneur she tossed her head she thought the old seigneur had relented towards her she turned away to the house with a flaunting air and got her hat at first she thought she would go to the house with the tall porch but she changed her mind and went to the boy noir instead parpon followed her a distance off behind in the mill ferrette was chuckling and rubbing his hands meanwhile armand was making his way towards the boy noir all at once in the shade of a great pine he stopped he looked about him astonished this is the old place what a fool i was then he said at that moment julie came quickly and lifted her hands towards him armand beloved armand she said armand looked at her sternly from her feet to her pitted forehead then wheeled and left her without a word she sank in a heap on the ground there was a sudden burst of tears and then she clenched her hands with fury someone laughed in the trees above her a shrill wild laugh she looked up frightened parpon presently dropped down beside her it was as i said whispered the dwarf and he touched her shoulder this was the full cup of shame she was silent there are others he whispered again she could not see his strange smile but she noticed that his voice was not as usual listen he urged and he sang softly over her shoulder for quite a minute she was amazed sing again she said i have wanted to sing to you like that for many years he replied and he sang a little more he cannot sing like that he wheedled and he stretched his arm around her shoulder she hung her head then flung it back again as she thought of armand i hate him she cried i hate him you will not throw meal on me any more or call me an idiot he pleaded no parpon she said he kissed her on the cheek she did not resent it but now he drew away smiled wickedly at her and said see we are even now poor julie then he laughed holding his little sides with huge hands imbecile he added and turning trotted away towards the rock of red pigeons she threw herself face forward in the dusty needles of the pine when she rose from her humiliation her face was as one who had seen the rags of harlequinade stripped from that mummer life leaving only naked being she had touched the limits of the endurable her sordid little hopes had split into fragments but when a human soul faces upon its past and sees a gargoyle at every milestone where an angel should be and in one flash of illumination the touch of genius to the smallest mind understands the pitiless comedy there comes the still stoic outlook julie was transformed all the possible years of her life were gathered into the force of one dreadful moment dreadful and wonderful her mean vanity was lost behind the pale sincerity of her face she was sincere at last the trivial commonness was gone from her coquetting shoulders and drooping eyelids and from her body had passed its flexuous softness she was a woman suffering human paying the price she walked slowly the way that parpon had gone looking neither to right nor left she climbed the long hillside and at last reached the summit where bundled in a steep corner was the rock of red pigeons as she emerged from the pines she stood for a moment and leaned with outstretched hand against a tree looking into the sunlight 
slowly her eyes shifted from the rock to the great ravine to whose farther side the sun was giving bastions of gold she was quiet presently she stepped into the light and came softly to the rock she walked slowly round it as though looking for some one at the lowest side of the rock rude narrow hollows were cut for the feet with a singular ease she climbed to the top of it it had a kind of hollow in which was a rude seat carved out of the stone seeing this a set look came to her face she was thinking of parpon the master of this place her business was with him she got down slowly and came over to the edge of the precipice steadying herself against a sapling she looked over down below was a whirlpool rising and falling a hungry funnel of death she drew back presently she peered again and once more withdrew she gazed round and then made another tour of the hill searching she returned to the precipice as she did so she heard a voice she looked and saw parpon seated upon a ledge of rock not far below a mocking laugh floated up to her but there was trouble in the laugh too a bitter sickness she did not notice that she looked about her not far away was a stone too heavy to carry but perhaps not too heavy to roll foot by foot she rolled it over she looked he was still there she stepped back as she did so a few pebbles crumbled away from her feet and fell where parpon perched she did not see or hear them fall he looked up and saw the stone creeping upon the edge like a flash he was on his feet and springing into the air to the right caught a tree steadfast in the rock the stone fell upon the ledge and bounded off again the look of the woman did not follow the stone she ran to the spot above the whirlpool and sprang out and down from parpon there came a wail such as the hills of the north never heard before dropping upon a ledge beneath and from that to a jutting tree which gave way he shot down into the whirlpool he caught julie's body as it was churned from life to death and then he fought there was a demon in the whirlpool but god and demon were working in the man nothing on earth could have unloosed that long brown arm from julie's drenched body the sun lifted an eyelid over the yellow bastions of rock and saw the fight once twice the shaggy head was caught beneath the surface but at last the man conquered inch by inch foot by foot parpon with the lifeless julie clamped in one arm climbed the rough wall on on up to the rock of red pigeons he bore her to the top of it then he laid her down and pillowed her head on his wet coat the huge hands came slowly down julie's soaked hair along her blanched cheek and shoulders caught her arms and held them he peered into her face the eyes had the film which veils here from hereafter on the lips was a mocking smile he stooped as if to kiss her the smile stopped him he drew back for a time then he leaned forward shut his eyes and her cold lips were his twilight dusk night came upon parpon and his dead the woman whom an impish fate had put into his heart with mockery and feudal pain end of section sixteen Section 17 of The Lane That Had No Turning. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Kate Follis. The Lane That Had No Turning and Other Tales Concerning the People of Pontiac by Gilbert Parker. Times were hard in Pontiac it was soon after the rebellion and there was little food to be had and less money and winter was at hand pontiac ever most loyal to old france though obedient to the english had herself sent few recruits to be shot down by colborne but she had emptied her pockets in sending to the front the fullness of her barns and the best cattle of her fields she gave her all she was frank in giving hid nothing and when her own trouble came there was no voice calling on her behalf and pontiac would rather starve than beg so as the winter went on she starved in silence and no one had more than sour milk and bread and a potato now and then the cure the avocat and the little chemist fared no better than the habitants for they gave all they had right and left and themselves often went hungry to bed and the truth is that few outside pontiac knew of her suffering she kept the secret of it close it seemed at last however to the cure that he must after all write to the world outside for help that was when he saw the faces of the children get pale and drawn there never was a time when there was so few fish in the river and so little game in the woods at last from the altar steps one sunday the cure with a calm sad voice told the people that for the dear children's sake they must sink their pride and ask help from without he would write first to the bishop of quebec for said he mother church will help us she will give us food and money to buy seed in the spring and please god we will pay all back in a year or two he paused a minute then continued some one must go to speak plainly and wisely of our trouble that there be no mistake we are not beggars we are only borrowers who will go i may not myself for who would give the blessed sacrament and speak to the sick or say mass and comfort you there was silence in the church for a moment and many faces meanwhile turned instinctively to m garon the avocat and some to the little chemist who will go asked the cure again it is a bitter journey but our pride must not be our shame in the end who will go every one expected that the avocat or the little chemist would rise but while they looked at each other waiting and sorrowful and the avocat's fingers fluttered to the seat in front of him to draw himself up a voice came from the corner opposite saying monsieur le cure i will go a strange painful silence fell on the people for a moment and then went round an almost incredulous whisper parpon the dwarf parpon's deep eyes were fixed on the cure his hunched body leaning on the rail in front of him his long strong arms stretched out as if he were begging for some good thing the murmur among the people increased but the cure raised his hand to command silence and his eyes gazed steadily at the dwarf it might seem that he was noting the huge head the shaggy hair the overhanging brows the weird face of this distortion of a thing made in god's own image but he was thinking instead of how the angel and the devil may live side by side in a man and neither be entirely driven out and the angel conquer in great times and seasons 
he beckoned to parpon to come over and the dwarf trotted with a sidelong motion to the chancel steps every face in the congregation was eager and some were mystified even anxious they all knew the singular power of the little man his knowledge his deep wit his judgment his occasional fierceness his infrequent malice but he was kind to children and the sick and the cure and the avocat and their little coterie respected him once everybody had worshipped him that was when he had sung in the mass the day of the funeral of the wife of ferret the miller for whom he worked it had been rumoured that in his hut by the rock of red pigeons up at dalgrowth mountain a voice of most wonderful power and sweetness had been heard singing but this was only rumour yet when the body of the miller's wife lay in the church he had sung so that men and women wept and held each other's hands for joy he had never sung since however his voice of silver was locked away in the cabinet of secret purposes which every man has somewhere in his own soul what will you say to the bishop parpon asked the cure the congregation stirred in their seats for they saw that the cure intended parpon to go parpon went up two steps of the chancel quietly and caught the arm of the cure drawing him down to whisper in his ear a flush and then a peculiar soft light passed over the cure's face and he raised his hands over parpon's head in benediction and said go my son and the blessing of god and of his dear son be with you then suddenly he turned to the altar and raising his hands he tried to speak but only said o lord thou knowest our pride and our vanity hear us and soon afterward with tearful eyes he preached from the text and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not five days later a little uncouth man took off his hat in the chief street of quebec and began to sing a song of picardy to an air which no man in french canada had ever heard little farmers on their way to the market by the place de cathedral stopped listening though every moment's delay lessened their chances of getting a stand in the market-place butchers and milkmen loitered regardless of waiting customers a little company of soldiers caught up the course and to avoid involuntary revolt their sergeant halted them that they might listen gentlemen strolling by doctor lawyer officer idler paused and forgot the raw climate for this marvellous voice in the unshapely body warmed them and they pushed in among the fast gathering crowd ladies hurrying by in their sleighs lost their hearts to the thrilling notes of little grey fisherman where is your daughter where is your daughter so sweet little grey man who comes over the water i have knelt down at her feet knelt at your gabrielle's feet see see presently the wife of the governor stepped out from her sleigh and coming over quickly took parpon's cap from his hand and went round among the crowd with it gathering money he is hungry he is poor she said with tears in her eyes she had known the song in her childhood and he who used to sing it to her was in her sight no more in vain the gentleman would have taken the cap from her she gathered the money herself and others followed and parpon sang on a night later a crowd gathered in the great hall of the city filling it to the doors to hear the dwarf sing 
he came on the platform dressed as he had entered the city with heavy home-made coat and trousers and moccasins and a red woolen comforter about his neck but this comforter he took off when he began to sing old france and new france and the loves and hates and joys and sorrows of all lands met that night in the soul of this dwarf with the divine voice who did not give them his name so that they called him for want of a better title the provencal and again two nights afterwards it was the same and yet again a third night and a fourth and the simple folk and wise folk also went mad after parpon the dwarf then suddenly he disappeared from quebec city and the next sunday morning while the cure was saying the last words of the mass he entered the church of st saviour at pontiac going up to the chancel steps he waited the murmuring of the people drew the cure's attention and then seeing parpon he came forward parpon drew from his breast a bag and put it in his hands and beckoning down the cure's head he whispered the cure turned to the altar and raised the bag towards it in ascription and thanksgiving then he turned to parpon again but the dwarf was trotting away down the aisle and from the church dear children said the cure we are saved and we are not shamed he held up the bag parpon has brought us two thousand dollars we shall have food to eat and there shall be more money against seed time the giver of this good gift demands that his name be not known such is all true charity let us pray so hard times passed from pontiac as the months went on but none save the cure and the avocat knew who had helped her in her hour of need End of section 17